There it is. There it is. Oh, Just see if it runs. Stephanie, I think we got it. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, oh, that works. Okay, good. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Sorry. Sorry about the. There you go. All right. I think we're ready. I'll give it a try. Thank you. Okay. This starts, the other day I was driving home from Chapel Hill, and I heard a ranting church preacher on the radio. And the church preacher was shouting about how our modern young people are just going downhill, and we have no future because all they do is look at their smartphones. Okay? So I'm going to flip that a little bit, and I thought about that more, and many times I think, and maybe this isn't popular, but I do believe students are customers because they choose to be here. And I would say, here's the deal. If you're looking at a smartphone, it's because what everybody else around you is saying or doing isn't as important or exciting or as relevant as that smartphone. So my job tonight is to keep you off that phone for about 45 minutes. Okay? And I'm trying. I've got about 81 slides, and I'm going to move fast and keep it churning. But I think you've got to sort of make sure your program is better than what's on the smartphone. So we'll see how that goes. Okay? So... Matt did so much, I can breeze through a ton. Okay, I'm an advertising professor. I've been, this is my sixth year, faculty in residence, and I love it. We do a lot of work with active living. I'm a co-founder of the active living community, and we have a lot of good things happening there, and that's uh, in the residence hall. I also do distance education. This semester, I got about 160 students total online. So what I do really is grade 160 papers a week. That's sort of what I do, and then respond. Okay, in my research, I'll just show you real quick. It's a little hard to see, but I like to do research and try to understand psychological predictors of people. What do they think and do about certain things? This was corporate social responsibility model. A little hard to see, but if you look at it, it really captured public image as one word cluster. We pick up the word clusters from focus groups, and then we use them in a survey instrument to cluster the words. And it, so it's really public image, and then the character of the company and the bottom one is value, the little one. So it's sort of like saying it's got to make money, but the big things are what's its public image and what's sort of the character of the brand, okay? And just one more. Here's one I just did through residents, and we studied uh, mostly freshman perception of uh, faculty. And if you look, the big predominant cluster is detrimental professor. A lot of the bad words, but almost as powerful, the next cluster is beneficial professor. Right? And then a third less powerful cluster, I called it experiential. I think it's sort of an interactive professor. Okay, so what we do is I study this type of thing, and then from that you hope to get some insights, and you think, well, if that's a predictor of behavior, maybe we can figure out the best messages to talk to those consumer groups. Okay? And fall 2015, I've never done a service learning project. I'm going to do one. I've met with uh, the folks here. We've got a connection with Habitat for Humanity. I think we're going to study donor perception of giving to Habitat for Humanity. What's their perception of that organization? And then from that, can we figure out how to better message to donors? Okay, so that's a little bit what I'm doing. I love social media. I'm trying to be a better Amazon publisher. I've got some books out now. They're on the Amazon digital platform Kindle. They're on Create Space, uh, Create Space Demand Paperback. So I try these things. I like to try it because I like to tell my students about it. I hope students publish and make a lot of money, have entrepreneurial, start writing books, etc. So I have blogs. I have a lot of things, and I'll show you a little more about that later. My hobby is endurance sport. Um, this is sort of what makes me what I am. I was terrible in sports. I never got to play in high school. I got cut from the basketball team. I tried out, well, let's see, grade school, like I sat on the bench. High school, I tried out for basketball, got cut. Uh, college, tried out for hockey, got cut, not good enough. Tried racing motorcycles, last place, not good enough. So I never was good at sports. And then the fall of 83, I was doing, you'll see it, some PR Wrangler stuff, and I'd put on a whole bunch of weight, and I was drinking a lot, a real lot, on the road. So I thought, i got to change, and over that fall of 83, I lost 45 pounds and started to get into bicycling and running, which got me into triathlon. There it is, 1985. And then later, how about the cutaway t-shirt look? <laughs> How's that? New York Marathon, 87. And I went from that to ultra running after that. And 
I'm still doing it. So I found something I can be okay at. I'm just an average guy, but I can finish events. And all of a sudden, I found a place to fit in. And we all like the inclusive message, right? Well, I'm an inclusive thing because I can be part of all this. So um, just see, so that's three weeks ago at Umstead. I went back to my favorite 100 miler and I dropped at 50. Sorry, I just didn't, I don't know. My foot hurt and I quit. So I made it 50 miles though. So I'm still. You know, I still like to participate, and that's what gets me going. I have a lot of, if you ever look this up, like I might say tonight to use your favorite search engine, because I don't like to promote that one that we all use. Use your favorite search engine and look up sometimes social identity theory. And I think a lot of my identity is tied up in being an ultra runner. I it just grew into it, and it meant so much to finish races. That, that's how I think about a lot of things. So that's something maybe to think about. Cycling with the Boone Area Cyclists is great. I do that too. And then I'm going to get you to where I start my story. Okay, so that's all sort of the setup on who I am and what I do. But here's me, three years old, and I'm holding my little brother, John. And um, here's where things get a little weird. I, I could just go on and tell you a typical baby story, but that's not what happens. So I will tell you this. When I was little, my mother used to always hold up this picture book. I can remember it and tell me how much I was loved because I was adopted. Okay, I was always told the adoption story. So many years later... I thought, well, I'd really like to learn a little bit more. So I found I was from the uh, orphanage in Milwaukee, and I got a hold of them. And they, what I got is all the transcripts of my birth mother talking to a social worker as she was about to give me up with the names redacted. I didn't want the names. I just wanted the story. This gets crazy. So here you go. I'm going to tell it. Because I, I wrote this before and didn't put it in, and then I thought if I didn't, it's not the authentic thing. Okay, so... My mother came from the country. She was from the farm. This is after World War II. We're talking now, this is about 1956. My mother came from the farm and made it to the big city of Milwaukee and got a factory job. And uh, she would work in the factory. And somehow she met my dad, my birth father, who was evidently from a prominent family, and he was an attorney. And he would go over to her house. And this is all transcribed. You know, this is what she's telling him. <laughs> he would go over to her house, and she would cook him dinner, and then they'd have sex. Okay, I was conceived. Out of that, there was total pushback. Birth dad wanted nothing to do with me. He already starts navigating out of the picture. Uh, mother doesn't want me because I'm going to ruin her Christmas. Okay, because I'm, I'm born December 18. So it gets better, worse. She finds some back alley doctor and tries to abort me. Okay, it doesn't take for some reason. Then she decides to have me. So she, what women did evidently in those, they, they went off to a home. You know, they went off and hid because it was so shameful to be pregnant. So she went off to some kind of little work home to have me. Well, I was born. Uh, I got some birth defects out of all this. You know, I, I'm not completely right, but I went through a lot of that. And I went to an orphanage. And evidently, the story goes on, I was, I was adopted and then returned six months later. So it's like REI sport, right? If you don't like it, you just give it back, right? <laughs> so I was given back. Is it going pretty well so far here? That's my mom and dad. Retro picture, 1980. Those are the people that adopted me. Okay, so I guess starting over about a year old. This is my whole backstory to being who I am. Now that my mom and dad, they always gave me fair break, treated me well, always did the best for me. But did anybody here go to the privilege forum the other night? You know, I thought about. I've been thinking a lot about that narrative and what it all means. But I thought, you know, if I got my first shot at privilege, it was getting out, not going back to that orphanage a third time. You know, that was my first shot, because what if these people had shuffled me back, right? Then I'd really, I mean, I might have been put into that foster system or who knows what, but nonetheless, after all that, whatever backstory that was, that's the mom and dad I knew, you know, that raised me. Now, I've got two other brothers, their blood with my parents. I'm the only adopted one, but, you know, I always felt I fit in okay. But the big thing, and this is the piece I'm getting to quickly, I've got a nature versus nurture issue, Okay. My parents are real hardworking Midwesterners. They, they never aspired to climb up very high. You know, the idea was sort of stay in your hierarchy, work hard, and have sort of common jobs. That's how we grew up. And I'm, I'm born something inside. I mean, I got wanderlust in me. I got, I'm always out there looking for a deal. I'm always wanting something new, and I think that must have come from my birth dad. I don't know where else I got it because it didn't come from this place. So I've always sort of been conflicted, and I'm always trying to push out there and find something exciting, but I was never raised that way, okay? So here's where I spend the first nine years of my life. This is Zion Lutheran Church in this little right here. 
That little one-story building is Zion Lutheran School, K through 8. I lived in a little tiny group of 30 students. We all went through together, right? And this is something I can still remember because I had a note of roll call up to my name, right? To call out. Randy, Norman, Neil, Amy, John, Keith, Kim, Kurt, Ken, Becky, Lori, Robert, Barbara, Mark, Tom. That's it. 50 years ago. I still know it. Okay, I don't remember after me, but I know how to get up to me. I don't know. If after the M's, I'm out. But I remember that. And this was, you know, that a real weird time in education, good and bad. But I'll tell you a quick story, and I get emotional about this. We used to have ABC reading groups, right? So it's shame-based right off the front. Everybody's got to go up front. And I was A. You do your thing. And then B's come up, and they struggle a little bit. And the first grade teacher's reaming on them a little bit. And then there was this boy named Bruce. We used to actually pick him up and bring him to school. I get This is hard for me. It still bugs me. She'd pull his ear till he cried every day. And, God darn it. I tried to find the guy. I can't find him. Because I... Oh, it's hard. I tell him I'm sorry. Still bugs me all these years. She made him cry every day in front of that class. So some some things just weren't good. I think that back in you know all my education I think about it isn't even about what I learned. All this stuff is what I remember or experiences. I don't remember anything I learned, but I remember that, right? So I went through that and and got to eighth grade and then I got kicked out into this deal. Wasa West High School. Had to go to public school, and plus we had been carting across town to the east side to the private school. When I hit public school, I had to go to the west side. So I lost all my friends. This was a rough place. Uh, card games in the, in the commons. We used to have drag races out front here. The guys would watch for the cops and grid the cars. And when it was clear, they'd drag race them right down that strip to the parking lot. And I was a 15-year-old boy, and I never saw motorcycles and cars go that fast in my life. That's what I called an education. I'd never seen anything like it racing up and down there rough you know we talk about bullying now I got beat up I got beat up in the hallway I got beat up out front school I didn't know how to street fight I'm a kid out of a Lutheran school I didn't know anything so I was really lost and sort of alone in that situation so there's a big setup right and I really didn't know but I did love motorcycles I got into that and I just loved motorcycles I just couldn't get enough and I found a way I don't remember what I was working I bought this Triumph 250 trophy and I rode it to school and it was parked in the parking lot and I was just not knowing what to do. And then this character there, Dwayne Stencil, came into my life. My brother John is over there in the Minnesota shirt. That's Dwayne. And he pulled up next to me in this orange 450 Honda that I later learned was his dad's, and he was sneaking it out of the garage every day. His dad was at work. <laughs> and he said, you can ride with me. And that kid, all accounts would say I went down the wrong path with Dwayne Stencil. But you know what? He's the one guy who adopted me. He took me in. And he took me into that circle of people in that rough environment you know so uh, we'll get back to that later but that was a real friend that had one English teacher Greg Venn and I don't even remember what he taught me or what class it was but he treated me a certain way that I really felt he cared about me and that's why I went into journalism he was he was a journalism English guy I didn't even know about anything but then my whole track of life came through that guy because he just the way he treated me so there's another guy I'll get back to that there I am at 18 now here's a weird story I graduated from high school a semester early and my mother still can't figure it out because I got put into a work study thing and every week I had to go report to the counselor and I was always working to pay for motorcycles and cars. So I'd report in and tell him I was working and then all of a sudden he said, guess what, you graduated. And I need, honestly, I'd been not going to all the classes. I said, really? He goes, yep, here's your diploma. You just graduated under the work study program. And I went home and told my mom I graduated. Mom, I'm out. And it was a semester early, and they couldn't, she, she still asked me, she's 88, she still goes, how'd you get out of high school? <laughs> so that's me, loaded up, loaded up motorcycles in a trailer, drove to Florida. This is another big one. Got down to Disney World and got a job, but they said I had to shave my mustache, cut off my hair, I wouldn't do it. If I would have got that job, I'd have been screwed. Because I would have ended up down there just kicking around in Florida. My life would have gone a completely different. So I ran out of money, came back to Wisconsin, built scaffolding for a greenhouse outside at 10 below zero in January. I said, I can't do this. You know, I'm scared of heights and my hands are cold. <laughs> so I got to go back to college. All right, so here we go. This is my first stint. I went to the, the Blue Goals. I could find out from Tom here. He used to work there. I'm an Eau Claire grad. So I did the local community college. You know, now we have so many transfers coming in from community. I was perfect for me because I wasn't that serious about college. The local campus was three blocks down the street. You just go down there, do what I did. Got a job running the game room at under, uh, junior college. 
Those were days I'm not proud of. I still used to smoke. We could smoke in the game room, and I used to run the pinball and foosball room and have the change box, and I got paid to do that. So, and I was also a pretty good foosball player out of that. So there's my what I remember about junior college. And then I went to Eau Claire and finished my last two years and got a journalism degree. Okay, so I'm tracking you through this a little bit now. There's me. There's my college. Look, I'm resurrecting. Now, the mustache, maybe not, but I'm going for that hair. I really like that, that hair, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to get back into that a little bit, right? And I like college. And here, by the way, is this is when I first moved to Eau Claire, I lived in a converted Ramada Inn. And I think of that so often because it's like our residence halls. This is my crew on 1978 at our Ramada Inn floor. So you can see we had quite a mix, quite a, quite a thing. You know, it was fun. It had a good mix going on. And uh, so that was that. And then, like every other college student, <laughs> I hopped on my KZ900 and rode all the way out to Sturgis, South Dakota for the biggest motorcycle rally in the country. Okay, there I am in Deadwood. So you can see I track normally through college, right? But, you know, I really didn't think so much about what college was. It was about these experiences I was creating along the way. And I don't know, like I said, I got something inside of me. I've always got to kick up some kind of deal. That's just the way I'm wired, you know. So first job, uh, I would tell you this. That's my job. I, I put out, when I was getting out of college, I put out a job application to Francesco Scuvalo, who was the top fashion photographer for Cosmo Covers, because I was really into studio photography. I was writing letters to Crawdaddy Magazine in New York, which was a rock and roll magazine, and didn't get that deal. But I'd sit in the back of lecture, and in those days, no smartphones, but I'd read cycle news. That's what I'd do. I'd sit in the back row and read cycle news. It's a weekly motorcycle newspaper, and I'd read every word. I'd read every word. They had a, a wanted ad in the back. I sent in a big photo pack, and I got hired. So I drove off to Atlanta, and I was the first one in my graduating class to get a job. So I went to Cycle News. There he is, first one. So I, 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 by all standards, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm sort of a bottom feeder academically, first one to get a job right here. Okay? And that was our shirt. We don't care how the hell they do it in California because we had an East and West Coast edition. So that's what, that's what we did. Now, there's my boss, Cycle News. That's Jack Mangus, hard guy, tough, tough, tough guy, tough. Yeah, boy, he'd scream at you all the time. He was a screamer. So, you know, tough. But he was, he, you just got to understand him. So it was a day we were making goofy pictures. But he was a really hard taskmaster, but he taught me news writing, really did. And I'll tell you why. This is a guy named David Jones. One of the first races I went to, he said, I got to get you to a dirt track. You got to learn how to cover these races. So we went to Louisville. Dirt tracks like this, and I'm standing on the infield. This is not a good story. Coming down the front straight, about 110, a drunken biker jumps over what clearly was a not high enough fence. Drunken biker runs right on the front straight. David Jones hits him, 110. Biker goes 20 feet up in the air, lands dead. He's dead. David Jones crushes his windpipe, cartwheels down the track. They tried to save him, dead. I'm a kid out of college. I'm just a kid out of college. I go, what am I going to do? And Jack says, you're going to write that story. And, and, and I, he had to teach me. How do you call a hospital and find cause of death? How do, you, how do you find out time of death? How do you write a, a description from the race promoter? What's his position? Clearly, you know, fencing, that's not right. There was an impending lawsuit later. He said, you've got to write this story. So guess what? I learned I got a job quick, and life's not fun. I mean, this stuff is not just jokes. This is two people dead right on the track, and, and, and I had to learn how to write it. But, but that's what it was, the like news writing. You know, you just got to push through and learn, and it all happened so fast. And I did a lot of stadium supercross and covered those all over, you know, all over the Eastern Sea. So I went to all the major sports stadiums and covered those races. And then how about this? You know who that guy is right there? Burt Reynolds there. Who's the other guy? Yep, and this is Doug DeMocus. That was shot at Cannibal Run 2. I had four seconds to make that cover. The thing was going to go. It was going to go out waiting, waiting, waiting. They're coming out. I got five seconds. Boom. And I still shot on Ektachrome film. To this day, it bugs me that should have been on Kodachrome, but it was a cover. Okay? And uh, Doug DeMocus, the Wheelie King, another story there, a good friend of mine, he's dead. He got killed in a hang gliding accident. So as, when you get older, you know, life's got a lot of ups and downs. It's all just not perfect. Who's the other guy with a microphone? Bruce Jenner. He's in the news right now, isn't he? That's Bruce Jenner working a Supercross about 1980. He was doing the NBC color, and I was down on the floor working for something. So Bruce Jenner. So, you know, you get to cross some paths along the way, right? And a couple more quick things. This guy's Henny Ray. He lived in Brussels, and he was our biggest contributor in Europe. And he taught me how to come to Europe. I was scared. I, again, I don't have any background in travel. It's not like today. 
I would stay in his little flat in Brussels and he would teach me how to travel. Okay, so hold that idea. One of my best friends for 30 years. Okay, and one day while I'm with him, here's another crazy, just make it up story. This is Andre Malherbe, who had just been the, the 1980 world champion at motocross. Big deal in my world, right? Somehow I get his number. I go to a pay phone. Henny Ray, I think, got his number. I called him. I said, can I come down to your house and do an interview? I just called him. And he goes, yeah, I'm home. You can come down. So I'd ask Henny how to get on a train and go down there. So I figured it out. It's in South Belgium. Somehow got to his door. And he let me spend a whole day at his house. And I'm thinking, I'm a kid off the streets of Wisconsin. And I'm with the world champion in, in Belgium, you know. And, and then we got done, and he said, well, how are you getting back to Brussels? And I said, I don't know. He said, let's go. I got, I'm going to run up there anyway. He took me in his sports car and ran me back to Brussels. And I thought at that moment, I mean, I'm just out of college about a year. I go, you can't make this stuff up. You know, that somehow I just stumbled into it. But you got to push into it. I think that's a lot of the lesson. So, uh, by the way, another sad tale. Andre Malherbe paralyzed from the neck down. Paris to car rally about two years later. Okay. So... The, these stories all have sort of a, I don't know why it is in my life, but there's sort of a dark current in some of this stuff. It's, you know, some bad back stories. Let me tell you one quick more. David Bailey, I saw him grow up from a very small racer into a world champion. This is a picture I took at um, Bajoria, Italy, which is the motorcycle, it was the motorcycle Olympics, and that was the year the Americans just totally dominated. That's a shot of David. You can see the crowd. He was a lap ahead. Fall of 86, January 11, 87, paralyzed, okay, crash in San Jose, California, okay. So I'll track this through, but those are all the types of things that have happened to me. Then I went into Wrangler, they got into Supercross, they were spending a bunch of money, a promoter friend of mine said, hey, Mueller can do it. They said, okay, can you do PR? Guess what I said? Yeah. Did I know it? I didn't have any idea, I can do it. I'll figure it out. So I got on the road and started to do PR for Wrangler, did all the motorcycle races that year. Then they asked me to do NASCAR, so I did Dale Earnhardt, 86 and 87, two championship years, right? And these, remember, look at this photo shoot. I can remember being at Dale's house in Lake Norman doing PR with the Charlotte TV affiliate. There sat little Junior. I ought to be like my daddy someday. Well, did we know Dale was going to die in a wreck, and did we know Junior was going to be the biggest guy in NASCAR? Who would have known, but I remember those days making that stuff, you know. And uh, next, Wrangler Bullfight. They said, can you do rodeo? I said, yeah, ah, sure, why not? I can do rodeo. <laughs> the best travel ever. I went all over the West, all the big rodeo towns all out West with this bullfight tour and took that around and, and promoted in each city. And we did a great promotion where if you uh, bought two pairs of Wrangler jeans, you got a rodeo ticket. We sold jeans. It was the best retail promotion you could ever imagine. So I did a lot of retail marketing, went all over the rodeos. Then last uh, here, Willie tour. There's me and girl Willie. We, Willie went on tour with Wrangler, and we did a Wrangler rodeo team with Willie. So I didn't do a ton of the tour, but I did the rodeo crossover, you know. And then we uh, we have we have uh, the Willie thing going on too. So. You know, I just stumbled into all this, and I thought, just by saying yes, you never know when you'll fail, though, and I'll tell you in a second when I did. But as long as you keep saying yes, at least you get that shot to try, right? So then I went to Mercury. I did powerboat racing. By the way, VF Corp bought Wrangler, closed down all the special events. That's how life works, right? Shut down special events. I went on, uh, got a job corporate at Mercury Marine, did all the powerboat racing, a lot of the catalog shoot stuff. And I did that for a while, okay? And then... Um, you know what happened when I was born, then this happened to me, okay? My second almost dead. So it's sort of like last lecture because I got two almost deads. Um, I don't know if you know what Guillain-Barre is, but, it, you know, I got a flu shot. That's how this happened to me. I got a flu shot in 92. It was the election night 92, Clinton won, and my body started to go down. I had not felt good. My arms start, stopped working. My legs stopped working. And I couldn't walk. So they got, got me to the hospital. I was in this little town. It wasn't good. The people there did not know what they were doing. So very quickly, they decided to transfer me to Milwaukee, where there was a specialist. The ambulance is going down there. I'm not making this part up. The ambulance gets lost. Get me to the hospital. They're driving around. And by that point, it was moving into my lungs. See, that's the part will kill you. And my breathing was going down. And we're driving around lost. And on top of it, my attending nurse gets car sick and pukes all inside the ambulance. And I'm laying there sort of, I'm doing pretty much um, morphine by that point. But I know, and then I remember 
They finally found it, and I remember this really violent experience in the emergency room, and I thought, why is this so violent? Well, guess what? They were getting that breathing tube down my throat because I, I had no time left. So I got there, and they saved me, right? I'm here. That's my second almost dead story, okay? So I got there in a couple months in the hospital, and uh, I remember, you know, you got to learn to re-swallow and aspirate, so you don't aspirate food, and you got to sit up. And I worked through all that, and I remember one day, about a month or so into recovery, I said, you know, I got a weird thought in my head. Every spring, I ran the Ice Age Trail 50 mile up in Wisconsin. I think I got eight finishes up there. And I said, it was like January, and I started, and I mentioned something to a nurse, and I said, I'm going to run that Ice Age 50 in May. And she laughed at me. She laughed and snickered and said, you'd be lucky to be in a walker by, by May. And that, that's where you self-assess. And I said, I, wanted, I think I'm capable. And I pushed and I built my own rehab program. I, I didn't do what they told me. I did more. And I ran that race in May. I, I made it back. And I thought, never listen. I mean, you got to listen to some regard, but always, and you'll get, I'll get to my, <laughs> sometimes, don't listen. I self-assessed, and you'll hear more about that, okay? Here's where I screwed up, my next job. I finally thought I made it to the top. I went to AMA Pro Racing. I was the executive director of motorcycle racing for the whole country. I thought I had made it. My dream, right? Worst mistake I ever made. I overpromoted myself. I put myself in a position I was not mature for. It's a dirty, ugly business, being in sanctioning and racing. Um, I'll tell you, you can look it up. One time I remember this West Coast race promoter was just screaming in my face. It was up at a Supercross suite. He's screaming this far from my face. Use your favorite search engine and look up Michael Goodwin. He's doing life in prison now. He had uh, two people shot and killed, Mickey Thompson and his wife Trudy. He's doing life for having him murdered. I'm just saying everybody's like that, but I knew I've crossed paths with Mike Goodwin enough to know I wasn't in that league. I'm not greedy. I'm not a real money grabber, and you better be to be in that business. It's real tough. So I had overpromoted myself. So guess what? I'm, the lesson here is, yeah, law sounds good. I pushed into all these great career things. This thing did not go well at all. So I really got in a bad place and went too far with what I had with my own abilities for that. Okay, and then I. They finally told me, the board of directors said, we want to demote you, but keep you in marketing for the same pay. Now, who wouldn't take that deal? I wouldn't. I was too proud. I said, no, I'll quit, and you can subcontract me for the sponsorship, because I wasn't going to take that demote deal. So I started sport management, ran that for eight years. Went pretty good. I learned two big things there, how to make a whole bunch of money and how to lose a whole bunch of money. Got uh, my biggest client at the end bankrupted and countersued me for 60 grand. Long story, but I was upside down about 150 grand on that. When you're a little shop, you can't take 150 grand hit, right? So that thing sort of fizzed out a bit because, again, a, a client bankrupted out on me. Last thing, I went to Wasserman Media Group and uh, bought, put Rally Car into X Games that year. Okay, it was the first year we had the Rally account. Now, a little bit more here on privilege. I thought about this too. You know, I think about privilege, and here's, I think, where I fell out of privilege there is there, there's a measurement that's out there, and it really cuts across, I think, in a way, race and gender and even religion in its age. And what I found there is as you get older, the younger person will beat you for the job. And I think that's what happened. You know, a lot of younger people were coming in, and I wasn't seen as valued anymore, and they were demoting me down, and I saw it coming. You know, I think that their image was for younger so I think as I got older, I didn't fit well into the whole career I had picked. So I sort of fell out on that. And then I had to figure, well, what do I do next, right? So here we go. I went to Otterbein in Ohio because I was living there, and I finally you know, had to do some extra classes. And I was, again, I'm, by this point, I'm getting older. I'm 58, by the way, so you know, I'm getting older, and I'm back in school in 2003, I think, starting over, getting my prereqs for an MBA and finish that. And then while I was there, here's another that crazy idea I came up with for a Study abroad, we went to Helsinki and St. Petersburg, Russia. And I got really enamored with St. Petersburg, and I ended up meeting some people. And I thought, what? This, where would you get this from? I go, why don't I put a speaking tour together and tour Russia? And I'll tell people about U.S. marketing. So this is the Institute of Business and Law in Rostov-on-Don, down in the Black Sea. If you look on a map, look in the Black Sea, the southwest part of this country. And they said, you fly over, we'll take care of this and put this tour together. So I did it. And I went here and I met the most fabulous people and saw all this culture. And here I am speaking to all the local civic leaders at this, and I just made all this up. Now, 
don't ever go to Russia and say you're representing U.S. business, because I'll tell you what happens. All the bad guys come out. It's, it, it, it will happen. They think you have money. They think you're representing U.S. money. And, and I would never do that again. I was naive. I didn't know. But I would never, I'd go over as an academic, because that doesn't threaten anybody. But if you go over there saying you represent U.S. business, they think you're representing investment money. So, man, I've got, there's things that happen there. I'm glad I got back, because it's, you know, sort of a crazy place. So I made that up, and I thought, again, just thought of an idea and tried, and it, it happened, and I got home. So then after that, my MBA um, advisor, or the director of the program, said, you should be an academic. So I said, well, I guess. I didn't think about that, PhD. And I honestly, with Florida, I thought, I've always liked Florida. I used to go down there for motorcycle races a lot. <laughs> think I'll go to Florida and go to school. I didn't know any better, you know? So I called him up. I said, can I come down there and go to school? And uh, no, they said no, and I kept bugging them. And finally, uh, Paul, you might remember Marilyn Roberts. Do you remember her? She says, fly down, fly down. I thought, wow. So I flew down there, and you know what I did? Here's a lesson. I looked up every professor that I was in the department, and I remembered one thing about them. I'm from sales, you know? So I'd say, Bob, now don't you write about so-and-so? And boy, Bob would be happy. And then I'd go, Betsy, isn't your study something about this? And she would be happy. And I just knew something about every person. And then a little while later, they said, well, you're in. So I got to go to Florida to get a PhD. And I thought it took a year. But if you keep selling and pushing, you know, sometimes maybe things will happen. So I got down there and got a PhD. And then this is where I'm at now. I got three job offers. And I got a job offer at Texas Christian in Fort Worth and Howard University in D.C. That would have been really interesting. But then I think it was even Paul. You might have been on the committee when I got hired, I think. This one, yeah, and I remember, and it was on the bubble. Remember that? The deal was on the bubble because the, the line of cash was sort of going in and out. And uh, finally, yeah, Paul, I remember he said, do it now or <laughs> something happened. But I, I really wanted to come here because I had such good memories from Greensboro, right? So then I'm in App State. So that's, where he, that's how the whole story went so far. So I'm going to finish with a couple Muellerisms, okay, and then we're done. Okay, you don't get a hit if you don't swing the bat. You got to take, you know, and there's this other saying, throw stuff on the wall and see what sticks. I hate that. That's sort of gross. But, <laughs> right? Here's my other one. Fly fishing. Fly fishing. Man, just you take that bait and just snick it on the water. You never know what's going to hit. Something may hit, but just a little bit. If it doesn't hit, go home. You don't fish that day. But you just keep putting little ideas out there and see what hooks up. And that's how you start building up things, okay? Self-assess, be realistic. Anybody know what this is? You've seen it in class. What is it? Standard, Standard de normal curve of distribution, right? Here's something we may don't. You know what? Honestly, I'll tell you. From, I know from this meeting, so people, you know where my intelligence is? Somewhere up around that mean curve. I don't think I'm that smart. I'm okay smart, but when I'm around other people, I clearly don't have the comprehension level they do. But you know what? I might work harder. I might time manage better. I might, I might sell harder. But you can work around that. But you know, just saying everybody's the most intelligent person, that's not how the world works. So I'm realistic about my limitations or abilities, and then I think, what are, the, what are the things I have to do to put on top of that to get you know, competitive? So this is that self-assess, OK? Here's one I everybody says, have a plan, big strategic, always have a life plan. I never had a plan that worked out, ever. <laughs> Everyone I've ever done for business, the minute we got it done, they. Oh, Everybody got fired, and they brought in new people, and it all started over again, you know? I'm not saying it's wrong. Like, even being in a university or getting a degree is a plan. But sometimes you just got to get the work around because stuff's not going to work out. And then you just got to stop and go, boy, that stalled out, or that AMA job is a bad deal, or, you know, something's going to go wrong. And then you just think, what's the work around on it? Because plans don't always pay in, right? Write it down. Here's the, my... Whenever I do advising, students don't come in with a writing instrument or a piece of paper. And I always ask them, you must have a photographic memory. And they go, well, no, why do you ask? I go, we're going to talk about 13 things, and you're not going to remember them, right? A couple things, two pieces here. Write it down for two reasons. One, always when you go to meetings, write down the date and the names and just a brief description of what happened. I'll tell you why. I avoided lawsuits doing this. I had people threaten to sue me, and I said, Bob, that meeting was April 12th. It happened at 11 o'clock. Here's where we were. Here's what you said, and here's what I said. And he backed off. Because there's power in having those notes. Because I'll tell you what, in business, people have selective memories. They will twist and skew things to their advantage. 
So keep some notes about what happened to protect yourself. Here's the other big thing. Write it down means if you ever have good ideas or a story in your mind or something, jot it down. Even at church, I always stop and take out those little kids' scribble pads all the time, and I'm always just putting stuff on there because I don't want to lose it while I'm at church because I guess that's what I do at church. So <laughs> anyway, but who's this? Do you know who this is? She, I read about her. You know, She wrote that book, a lot of it during the spring break. And what's she got now? Three books out now? With all four? With all the movie options? It could be anybody in here. This is a, nowadays with this new publishing model we have, anybody in here could write and hit a book. You never know. And that's why I say to students all the time, write it down. When some of my students, my online students, they're, they're really advanced because they're older students, someone will put in uh, four or 5,000 words on a week forum post. I tell the best students, that's too good for this assignment. Repurpose that out there. Use that somewhere. Put it in your social media. Promote it. Because don't just lose it in an assignment. Everything you write is content. You should use it to promote yourself. Okay. It's challenge self-perceptions. This one gets me a little bit real quick. I got permission. These are two of my online students right now. Melissa Marlowe, single mom, now a grandmom too. Told she wasn't smart enough. Told she wasn't the kind of person that should have a college degree. Okay. She finally got in. Her life dream is to get a college degree. She's going to be one of she's one of our best students, and she's getting her finishing up. Told me now, taking a year off to save money, wants to talk about grad school. That gets me emotional. Doggone it! And, and Zong Yin came in, said, "Hey, I can I have terrible comprehension and I can't write." Came in with Com 1200. I said, "Let's start from the basics." I said, "Read this way. Here's a template on how to write an essay." Guys, in, he's writing MBA level quality work now. Because he had this thing in his mind that says, I'm not that person. But you know what? Just coach somebody along and who knows what's in there. You know, so just challenge that, okay? Uh, real quick here, you're either giving pain or taking it away. You think about that in everything you do. Um, people come up, hey, can you uh, get that report for me Wednesday? Well, that depends. You know, I really, Bob hasn't talked to me yet and Sally didn't do her part. Pain, pain, pain. I'm getting pain. Hey, can you have the report to me? Let me tell you what. I'll have four parts of that done. It'll be on your desk at 9 o'clock, and I'd like to come in at 9.30 so I can help review that with you. You're taking pain away. In business or whatever, just think about that as your workplace, even helping other people. Is your response given pain or taking it away? I always measure that, okay? What's the most important brand in the world? Your brand. Tell all my students, build your own brand. One of the biggest mistakes I made in business, I spent too much time making other people successful. I got paid for it, but you know, Dale Earnhardt never did me any favors. He just got rich. Okay, all he ever bitched to me about was where's more money. Everything I ever did, he wanted more money. But you know, I'm working and making him famous. And I spent a lot of my life making other people famous. Build your own brand, right? Build your own equity. Okay. Social media, keep pushing a day. I, if anybody wants to talk to me any other time, I've got this little thing about how I do a social media, moving across all the platforms. I'd love to talk to you about it. But how about today? John Osborne came and talked to us. I'm done. I got retweeted by him already, and I'm already friended up on LinkedIn. Okay? Swing the bat immediately. And what I did, if some of you heard this at breakfast, I put there to his, you know, I, I, I put out to his... Uh, his Twitter ID, thanks for investing in our ASU students, then I put his quote in there. It's not what you do when you're on top, it's what you do when times are down. He was on that in one minute, retweeted. So, you know, and then after that I went to LinkedIn, asked to be his, you know, whatever connect it is, and I got my LinkedIn connect with him too. So the point is, I just did a big networking piece 30 minutes after that thing ended. You just got you gotta swing the bat and move fast. Okay? Uh, here's my other favorite one, D. Snyder. This was a big day at the office last week, okay? I love listening to old retro rock podcasts, and there was this big podcast on about, you know, the bands nowadays that put the replacement singers in and such, when's the band still authentic, and he was going off on, if you don't know Dee Snyder, he's a lead man for Twisted Sister, if you, if you use your favorite search engine and also look, he was very famous in the 80s, he stood up at a Senate subcommittee meeting when Tipper Gore and some other people were trying to put parental controls on rock music and label and restrict them on the packaging. And D. Snyder, they thought they'd laugh him off. He was really eloquent. You can see that on YouTube if you'd like. Anyway, I go out there and put out a little tweet to him about, hey, what about Van Halen? About the two, you know, Sammy, uh, Sammy Hagar and David Lee Roth. Which one's legitimate? 
he picks it up, favors it, and retweets it to his 128,000 followers. Okay? Little thing, I don't know where that'll lead, but man, I'll take any day I can get in front of 20, 128,000 people, right? Just think about what matters to other people. Not about what you think, but sort of what other people are talking about and see if you can't get that big connect. Okay? Do that. First, seek to understand, then to be understood. I got just a couple more here. Stephen Colby did this in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Living, I think it is. That it? Take a look if you haven't. Just think about the other point of view first. That's all. It's really important. Before you try, nowadays I hate this media shouting heads thing. Stop to think what the other person has in their mind first, okay? And this isn't always true, but I test many things with this. Many times I see life as I think it should be, and I'm angry about something, and then I think, well, let me think about that. Maybe it's just different. Someone else is doing it different. It might not be better or worse. It's just different. I tell you what, 80, 90% of the time, that's what it will be. It's just because I think it should be a certain way doesn't mean it's right or wrong my way or right my way. Just different, okay? Encourage off and criticize with care. I do this 160 times a week. Got so many papers I grade. Always a positive, I think you did well here, but. Okay, we just, you know, and then craft that criticism real carefully because it's, people are hard with criticism. We all are. I think you need it. People want to improve, but you'd be real careful how you present it. Okay, a couple more here. Social debate, it's back to what I said. I think we need to talk more and respect others. I, again, the privilege forum I thought was well done. There was a lot of good interaction there, people talking. Um, I think we need more of that. You know, it doesn't have to be Fox versus MSNBC. We don't have to shout at each other. And just We used to have a society where people talked and tried to understand other points of view. And I think for the student's sake, no matter what a student's point of view is, they should at least be able to be respected to present that. And I think we should work toward it, okay? And then here's what I'm going to finish up for you. Friends, some last a lifetime, some won't, okay? This guy, Richard D. Libertis, was a Cycle News contributor, okay? In the 1980, I used to edit all his stories from New England. He sent in all the race reports. Contacts me on Facebook last week. There he is. He said, my dad died. I wrote the eulogy. Will you edit me like the old days? 30 some years later, I'm going to get emotional here. I said, Richard, I'll help you. So, you know, friendships, man. Henny Ray, my friend, we couldn't find him one day. Found him dead in his apartment in New York. Had a heart attack and died right at his computer. So he's been dead a couple years now. And uh, that's how life goes, man. You know, people are starting to slip, slip away a little bit. Henny Ray was about my age, he passed. That guy there, Gary Gisselman, my seventh grade school teacher at Zion, still alive. See him every time I go home. Still talk to him, Gary Gisselman, seventh grade. Dwayne, remember my friend? There he is. <laughs> Hasn't changed much. Hasn't changed. <laughs> but you know what? You know, we went down different paths in life, but if I hear that old Harley of his rattling up the road, I'm always going to pull over. And you know what? He, he did me right. He did me right, and I'll never forget it. Okay? And Greg Venn. Back our hometown paper had a contest where you could nominate your favorite teachers from the past, and mine won. And I, here's the headline, Vietnam, Wausau West grad, because I was right at the end of Nam, said, teacher treating me like a man. And we had a big story for Greg, and I still see him. He's like, he, he lives in New York quite a bit now. But again, I was able to give back just a little bit to someone who helped me, you know? David Bailey, my paralyzed friend. Just last week, him and his wife, he lives in California, he went on to win the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon in a wheelchair. Okay, so he, there's him, still friends. Okay, so over time, some of them are still there, you know. And there's, here's my last part. Here's me today, I think, my job is to get sort of ready, get ready to step out of the way. Because everybody, the young students, whoever's in here, when you're getting ready to graduate, you're the leaders. You're the ones that got to step up and take over, and I know that every day I teach. This is, you know, our active living folks up on the, on the parkway. I look out and say it's my job to try to help them in any way I can because they're going to be running the thing. The whole, wherever we run, they're going to be running it in a couple of years, right? And when we go on advertising club trips, I think of all those students, they got to step up into the jobs. You know, maybe they're out there with the next NASCAR guy or doing rodeo or whatever they do. It's your time. This is your time because my time, I'm, I'm there to help. But it's time for me to start stepping aside so you can take over, okay? And then, of course, we have new professors coming in. We have a lot of diversity, people with new ideas that I'm never going to have. I mean, in my, my life, my crazy stuff's from the 80s and 90s. New people come in, new ideas, different ways of teaching. That's the way it should be, 
That's the way our life works, okay? And that's it. I'm still looking at that rainbow, man. I think what's next, um, I got a couple books in mind, probably run a couple more races. Who knows what's coming next? So that's it. I don't know, you know what's all in there because it's sort of a messy story, but uh, that's all I have. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was excellent. And I think we all learned something from that. I know that uh, we are kind of running low on time, but I wanted to give you a quick gift. Oh, how nice. Okay. Thank you. For sure. So uh, traditionally, we give the book of the man that started all of this. Yes. So this is Randy Pausch's book with a little note from me in there. Thank you. So Thank enjoy you. that. But we also have one more gift for you oh. that others have not gotten. Oh. So there you go. <laughs> so, so, uh -oh. so I might set this up here real quick. All right. So this is to commemorate your time with housing. And we oh. know that your whole time has been amazing, uh, but we want to at least recognize you for all the work that you've done for us. Nice. And right here, and we'll give you this box, of course, to oh. take with you. But it's, a, it's an award hopefully you can put in your office. I will. And it just commemorates your ex uh, excellence experience with us in housing. So there you Thank go. you. Uh, nice. Thank you. Awesome. Definitely. I'm going myself. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. We wish we could give you more. Oh, so, no, no. This cool. is so nice. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. I know that you have other things tonight. Tonight is so busy. So uh, feel free to grab the rest of the food or take some with you. The clamshells are right under the table there. And enjoy. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Have a good night. Oh, how nice this. 